what has been a very, very poor past few days of weather, a nice Saturday at Kenny Stadium. Phil Grignot with Matt Suter, Pat Dillon, the president of the Student Booster Club, is joining us. We are the Maris Football Network for our kickoff show. Matt, great to be out here finally. You know, it is, and last night around just about, what, 16 hours ago, we didn't think we were going to get this in. Rain all day last night. All day last night, that makes a lot of sense. But rain for the majority of the day yesterday, so we actually packed it up, but then we got up early this morning, a couple of us. We got here early, and it's honestly, we couldn't have asked for better, better weather, some sun, a little humid, but a nice little breeze, and, uh, you know, perfect day for the home opener. Absolutely, we've been fortunate enough to work in conjunction with Marist College Athletics to help us put this program together. We are a group of five senior students. This is part of our capping project, or capstone project, as it's officially called. But Pat Dillon is our first guest. We know you have a lot of responsibilities going on today. We don't want to tie you up for too long. Are you expecting a big crowd today from students? Yeah, we actually, this is really exciting for us. This is our first official Student Booster Club uh, kickoff tailgate to start the year. Um, we started at 11.30, handing out t-shirts for the first 300 student fans. We have food other uh, down in the south side of the stadium over here. And uh, people are hanging around. There's some games going on over there. We're getting people in the stands early. And hopefully that gives us some uh, energy to start the game with. And now, Pat, this club is really only in its third full year of existence. It started three years ago for about a month before the end of the school year, and this is already one of the largest clubs on campus. Has that translated into this year's freshman class? I definitely think so. People are already coming on campus saying, oh, that's Student Booster Club. I know a lot of people that were in that last year, and it definitely gives us a better presence to start the year. And I think starting off, I know football started late, but having the tailgate was a good thing. We moved our meeting back a little bit this year. That kind of helped because it got a little more word, a little more word out. There was uh, more advertising for it. Um, and I think it's been great so far. We gave out all our t-shirts already and it's only 12 o'clock, so it's an exciting thing. Pat, how about, let's say, uh, for the football team, for instance, when they have a class of freshmen, that's, let's say, roughly 40, it, it seems to increase every single year. Does that help your cause, having more freshman players mix in with the rest of the student body who are you trying to actively get to these games? I never really thought about it like that, but that's a, definitely, I think that might, that might be a good thing. Um, you said there's about 40 of them. Definitely seeing them in the cafeteria and things like that, having them on their floors in the dorms. I think that definitely attracts people. It has to help. And we're going to let you plug quickly. What does the entire student body at Marist College need to know about the Booster Club? Everyone is hungry for priority points. They want to swipe into these games. We'll let you plug for a moment here. What does everyone need to know? All right, so basically here's the information. We have three meetings this semester. We already have our first one, but we have two more this semester, October 6th and I believe November 3rd. Um, basically, to earn priority points, you have to earn booster points. Football and basketball games are worth two points. Uh, every other event is worth one. Once you uh, reach 10 points or 15 points, it's one priority point and two priority points. It's a cool thing. Another thing we're doing this semester is apparel sales of Red Fox Nation pennies. It's got this logo on it, Red Fox Nation pennies, Red Fox Nation sweatshirts. And you can order them now through October 6th. They're over at our, uh, at our table at all the sign-ins for games from now until then. What are the chances that Matt and I can steal two t-shirts from you guys? Well, I don't know about that. I think we already did, actually. <laughs> Look, looking at my bag, I think we already got a couple t-shirts. I don't know how you Whether got you know them. about that or not, I don't know. But, uh, they were hand-delivered. Hand-delivered, says Mike. We are, we are through our third of five members. So, Pat, we know you're busy. Thank you for joining us. Good luck for what I'm sure will be another successful year for the Booster Club. Right. Thanks so much. And Matt, just quickly, if you may, a big football day here. I wanted to run by uh, the Pioneer Football League standings just to give everyone a gist of what exactly it is that we're talking about here in this, what is a national conference. So just running down the standings quickly, Dayton at 1-0. We've uh, Many teams, actually, this will be their first week of conference play. Dayton currently in first place with at 1-0 mark, and Marist at, in the basement of the PFL with an 0-1 mark. Now, the teams that have yet to register either a win or loss in week play, we have Butler, Drake, San Diego, Campbell, Davidson, Jacksonville, Moorhead State, and Valparaiso. So all those teams, the eight that have not competed yet, they'll sort, they're all jumbled right now, but they'll sort of shuffle out once this day is completed. And that's why it's a little interesting. Mayor started last week in the PFL with that game at Dayton, but now this year, or excuse me, this week, they come back for this home opener against a non-league opponent in Georgetown who competes in the Patriot League. And honestly, they're off to a pretty good start, though, with a little slip-up uh, at Yale last week. 
You're right, they have posted a two and one record so far, and these matchups are so, so much fun to watch. And you and I were chatting before we came on air here today about how six of the last seven matchups between Maris and the Georgetown Hoyas have been decided by seven points or less, and two of those, I believe, when it's overtime as well. Yeah, and so this has always been a fun environment, and one of the neat things about this, and if history plays any part of it, comes into today, this home team has won the last seven contests between the two teams, so this, these are two very evenly matched teams. It seems like it's a good environment. The guys, as we talked to Fed Celestin in our pregame show on Wednesday, very amped up. They're happy to be home at Tenney Stadium for the first time this season. So as we can just see, you've seen them warm up right now. You know, a lot of cheers, a lot of yells. They're ready to get on the field here and take on Georgetown, who, as we mentioned, they've been very even with the last couple of seasons. That's right, and of course, the Maris College Red Foxes, they are decked out in their red tops and red pants while Georgetown is going with the all-white. And as you and I were walking around the stadium perimeter this morning, we, we heard one of the players say, how's the red and red going to look? I'm liking it. You know what? It's the red pants are decent. You got some white trim in there, so you know it's not all all red. You got some guys with the high socks, white right in here. Uh, so you know it's it's a decent balance. The white helmets, of course, balance it out. You don't want all red. So I, honestly, I'm not too worried about it. it. Looks like a good good scene. So now I think it's a very unique brand, the Maris College Red Fox. Of course, with the rebranding over the past two years, it's a very sharp logo, and I like what they've got going on with Nike as well. The partnership, and that almost goes in with the entire ideology of the campus over the last couple of years. There's been a lot of renovations. Just the newest in the athletic department itself is the new McCann Arena. And don't call it the McCann Center anymore, the McCann Arena. Now it's been renovated, so there's chair back seats on both sides of the court. You have a much larger student section. So while there were some renovations, there's actually still equal capacity to what it was beforehand. And then get moving away from the athletic side, there's also the Hancock Center, which $32.5 million new academic building. And now, don't call it a tunnel, it's a pedestrian underpass going under Route 9, so it connects both the east and west side of campus. It's a lot safer for students. There's no more crosswalk going down the main entrance. So there's been a lot going on on campus in the last couple of years, and the ac or, excuse me, athletic rebranding has just been part of it. And Matt, you mentioned that there's a lot going on on campus. Perhaps is there a better, could there be a better weekend to showcase all this than Alumni Weekend? A lot of red boxes, the sign that hangs above the rotunda student center, Welcome Home Boxes. What a phenomenal weekend for people of all classes that have graduated from Maris. No, and it's always fun for Alumni Weekend. I know we can speak as students that a lot of times you have students that have graduated a year or two ago that come back. You're always happy to see them. But then again, every five and ten years you have people coming back. So, for example, the class of 1971 is their 40th year reunion. So you have some members of the class of 1971 on campus, and of course, 81 and so on and so on. And again, it's nice that this does work out for this home opener football game. It is Alumni Weekend. There's so much to show off on campus. So it really worked out well for the college. Mention that, that class of 1971 in particular. Now, we don't want to give anything too away, perhaps a small spoiler here. We've heard rumors that a very, very well known Maris alumni might be tossing the coin a little bit later at 1 p.m. Yeah, if you're familiar with Fox News and you know anything about Maris, maybe that gives you a little bit of a hint. But again, we won't be name dropping at all. Uh, but let's get into talk about a little bit of today's game. You know, we mentioned. Very briefly, you know, Georgetown's in here at 2-1, and one. Maris at 1-2, and two. Maris coming off a two-game losing streak, but the big thing over in that week one win against Sacred Heart, Jim Parity's 100th career victory at the helm of Maris. That's absolutely right, and earlier this week when we had the opportunity to catch up, you know, with head coach Parity, he did mention how nice it would have been, in fact, to capture that 100th win at home. Nonetheless, it came not, not too far away in Connecticut, the 100th win is certainly a great milestone for someone who's been with this program for 20 years. And Jim Parity, anyone you talk to on campus, uh, all, anywhere around the athletic department. Jim Parity is one of the nicest people on this campus. He's always willing to help out any students, like, for example, us with his student media project. But all, he's just a great guy to know. And so it really couldn't have happened to a better guy on this campus. I know the Marist community was very, very happy when Jim Parity notched that 100th career victory. And after, actually, up until this point, we haven't had the chance to introduce uh, the other three members who aren't currently on stage of Mike Quinn, Rachel Blair, and Amanda Master Brady doing an excellent job with us. And to tie it into Coach Parody, when we bombarded him on Tuesday with an interview request that was, I would say, albeit a bit unannounced, he was very, very, very accommodating with us, and that was great to see. And sort of just, again, give me a nice little refresher. We are the Marist Football Network. This is sort of something that hasn't been done before. It's a student capstone group. We're a group of seniors that are making the Marist football team our senior project for 2011. So you can follow us online at www.maristfootballnetwork.com. You can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook. We have pictures posted up online on Flickr. We have a YouTube account. So we're all over the place. You can find us anywhere. And so we're really excited to bring this to you all throughout the season, and look for weeks leading up to Marathon football games. We will be releasing shows, we'll be releasing updates, and we will be here every Saturday before kickoff, right? Well, I can't say in this exact location. We're working out kinks.
But for now, we're right here and we'll always be around prior to kickoff. And part of the driving force, man, I think that when the five of us came together and decided to put forth this effort to cover the football team was the sheer amount of storylines you have going on. Marist is very unique in that it's a small private school in the Northeast, which is not typically a hotbed of Division I football. And we've seen so many programs in the MAC that have chosen to simply drop their football team. Most recently, Iona College back in 2008, Marist made the decision to keep this program and it certainly paid off. And it's really neat because you mentioned the MAC, so it's, you know, the MAC for basketball, soccer, other sports is a small Northeast conference of private colleges. But now Marist has gone into this pioneer football league. It's their third year in the PFL. And as we mentioned earlier, it's a national conference. So we travel to San Diego. We travel to Jacksonville, Drake, all over the country. And it really puts Marist on the map a little bit more. And it gets our name out there. And it's interesting because Marist, over the past five or so years, has become a much more competitive academic school. And applications have increased. So by that factor, the selectivity has gone down. It's much tougher to get into Marist than it was, like we said, just about five years ago. And you have to look at it and think that that has something to do with it, with athletics, especially when you look at the popularity of the Marist women's basketball team. Oh, well, well certainly, it certainly has to, Matt. There's no question about that direct correlation there, I think. And as far as Marist being competing in this national conference in the Pioneer Football League, as you mentioned, it does afford the team to travel all over the country to a number of different states. And in turn, Marist has, I believe, currently on its roster, players from 14 different states. If we were discussing this program a decade ago, that would be absolutely unheard of. That number would be half. And of course, just going back to that theme of renovations on campus, Tenney Stadium itself was just renovated five years ago. In 2000, as of 2007, only football played their home games here. It was a grass field, and the bleachers were actually on the far side of the field. But after 2007, as you can see, there's a big turf, state, big turf playing service. The grandstand, the press box, that's all new. The grass seating area over on the other side of the field is also new as of 2007. So that's done a lot. There's been a lot in the past couple of years, which we've all talked about, which has just made the school much more marketable than not only its athletes, but also its students. Well, there's certainly no question about that. And, of course, we are here this afternoon for what should be an excellent contest against the Georgetown Boys. And looking forward a bit, next Saturday on October 1st, the Jacksonville Dolphins will come to town. And Jacksonville's a very accomplished squad. There have been rumors, actually, Matt, about their uh, administration trying to get this team to become an FBS school, which I think would be remarkable. But certainly, Jacksonville, a tough matchup. Well, Jacksonville historically has always been very, very strong as in the FCS rankings, they've been top 25 in each of the past couple of seasons. And one thing to remember, though, just two years ago, this Mayor's team beat Jacksonville on what was a last-second thriller. The final score is 31-30 to on a last-second touchdown. So Mayor's can compete with anyone in this conference. The talent is certainly there. So Jacksonville will have its hands full, although you did mention very intricate offense that Jacksonville runs. Well, certainly, we see that for many of the Pioneer Football League teams as well, even in particular the Dayton Flyers, who Maris dropped a 24-10 to decision to last weekend. And I think just looking forward, after Jacksonville, October 8th, there's a matchup at Davidson. Then the Red Foxes will return home to play Campbell before traveling at Butler. Then they'll have two games at home, Drake and Valparaiso, before finally finishing up out west on the 12th of November at San Diego. So the Red Foxes hopping around a bit back and forth in what is an 11-game schedule. And it is a little bit of a funky schedule because the season starts off with three games on the road. Then they come back to play all five of their home games in a seven-week span before finishing the season on the road. So there's a lot of travel involved at certain points of the season. But now looking ahead to the next two months, really, they're only on the road two more times in those next two months. So it works out to that advantage that there won't be a lot of travel. They're not taking those long bus rides. They're not taking many long plane rides like they did in the first three weeks of this season. And you mentioned the travel for the Marist College Red Foxes. When we conferred with Coach Parody earlier this week, he told us, well, the reality of traveling football is that you're only bringing a shade above 50 players with you. You're not bringing 70-plus guys. That's what makes this homecoming so special for a lot of the freshman players. We're going to see the stands just, just behind us full for the first time. They've been practicing out here every day. They'll be here 3.30, 6.30, a lot of empty seats. But that'll change. That'll change in about 40 minutes. And that is neat that on Alumni Weekend is when the freshmen get to first step on the field. So it should be a good environment. As you mentioned, a lot of alumni here today. There will be, especially from classes of 71 to 76, and I could go on and on, but my math isn't that great off the top of my head. So it should be a fantastic environment. And I know that we're excited to finally see some football because the fans, of course, let alone the players, they haven't been able to play here, but the fans really haven't been able to see much on their own campus. No, that's certainly true, and it's very odd to think that Marist, in what is really, I suppose, the fourth, fourth week, rather, of the semester, today is the 24th of September, 
it's been a long delay until we've seen a home football game. Now, the three contests that have taken place away, so starting with Sacred Heart, then Bucknell, and then most recently with Dayton, we know that Ed Weir and Jeff Roll and also Mike Farrell do a great job on the radio broadcast for Marist. So the fans have been able to follow this team going on, a lot going on with Marist Athletics Twitter, and we've tried to keep everyone updated as well, but you certainly can't replace an atmosphere like this. No, absolutely not. There's nothing quite like that Saturday morning feel when you wake up. And I know about football players. I did. I was a kicker for a high school team for one year in high school, so I have that football mentality still with me. And, you know, you sort of get up on that game day, and there's just a little bit extra adrenaline. Again, when we talked with Fed Celestin, the junior starting offensive lineman, on Wednesday, he talked about the adrenaline that, you know, you don't necessarily get on the road. Before every game, you do get pumped up, but when you put on that home uniform, it becomes a completely different atmosphere when you see the stands packed in your home colors. I think there's a lot to be said for that. In particular, let's take a, a game like Bucknell, where Maris has to travel up to Pennsylvania. It's not easy to sit on a bus for four plus hours. You know, if you're cramped, you're seated next to everyone in these buses, they have to get off and play a really rigorous football game. But here, it's a little much more of a relaxed environment. The teammates can have breakfast all together in the cafeteria, stroll over it, they're assigned times in all the positions, throw into the locker room, the two locker rooms, I should say, rather, that we have. So certainly, much more of a relaxed atmosphere. And that goes into the pregame warm-ups as well. Not many people, I think, really understand what goes into a pregame warm-up for a football game. These guys are out here, no pads, just sort of warm up. You know, two, two and a half hours before the game, getting their stretches in. They go back into the locker room, they put on the pads, they come out and all everything, they're decked out in all their gear, and then they have to start up again. And then that's really when the environment starts coming. That's when the screams start coming out. That's when the let's go start coming out. And, you know, when you see that clock ticking, again, 45 minutes away from kickoff right now, they can feel that they got the pump-up music in the background. And then, you know, once that first kickoff is up, it's go time. We're very happy to be joined right now by Tommy Riley's grandfather, sir. Very nice to have you. How are you today? Fine, fine thank you. Very good, very good day for football. It's a gorgeous day. Now, have you gotten to see any of the games so far this season? All three games so far. And what have you thought of the team so far in the year? I think we should be 3-0. That's an honest opinion. Now, <laughs> and, and so you made the trek out to Dayton as well? Yes, we did. I travel all over. I go to all the games. I don't miss a game of any of my children. Two play soccer for Vill one Villanova, one State Joe University, and Tommy's at Marathon. So how does that go? A soccer and a football family? I get one day off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are actually both members of the same class of 2012 that Tommy is. We're both seniors as well. And we've had the chance to watch him play over the past three years as well. Has he enjoyed his experience at Marist? He's had, had a fantastic season last year and he enjoyed everything. And he wants to graduate from Marist. And uh, now his knee, he's actually been recovered from that injury that he suffered. So we've seen him up around and practice and walk around. He looks good. Yeah, he worked hard all summer long. He come in, in camp real well, good shape. He ran all summer long and done a lot of exercises. Now, you might know a little bit more about it than us. Last spring, you know, he had to miss a significant amount of the spring season with that injury. Was that frustrating for him? Very frustrating. He's, he's, he's a competitor, he's a leader, and he's a team leader. And it's very frustrating for him to get hurt and not be able to get in there to give 100%. And how about today, the Red Fox is taking on Georgetown, a team not in the Pioneer Football League. How do you think about their chances today? I think we have a very good chance. We play good football, good defense, and we move the ball, and I think we'll beat them. Now, what do you know about Georgetown? Do you know a lot about them? Now, I know that you're a fan. You go to every game. Do you scout the other teams beforehand? No, I don't. I don't know nothing about Georgetown. All I know is they're going to, they're going to go down today. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we like to hear. So thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to speaking with you in the future as well. Anytime you pass by, let us know if you want to come up on stage. We'd love to talk to you again. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shooter actually stopping by the set, and we're so very, very pleased. And have the Maris mascot with us. And not only not only is Shooter joining us, but he's also decking a new red uniform. There's going red on red this year. Usually Shooter has a nice white uniform, but for the 2011 home opener, Shooter's blending right in. And this might be a photo op. Let's get a photo op of Shooter right here. It must be. Oh, we got one more. We got one more. Hold on, Shooter, real quick. Okay, are we going to plug on this one? All right, so. So, Shooter, we know that you can't really talk. Maybe you can just sort of motion out for us. How do you think Maris is going to do today against Georgetown? <laughs> Pass for a touchdown. Georgetown's going down. Was that right? There we go. I thought I was going to get a... Pick, I picked up that as well. I thought I was going to get like a thumbs up maybe, something a lot more simple, but I like the intricacy. And, you know, Shooter's pumped. I can tell. You know, he hasn't, he hasn't been able to get out a lot this year, but home opener for the football team, this is sort of your element, right? 
They made you wait almost four weeks until September 24th to get out here. But uh, have you, you've been hitting the gym a little bit? This is a form-fitting shirt. You know, pumping up in the auto. Oh, yeah, look at these shoulders, too. Shooter's ready. Shooter's good to go. Tell you well, what, the Nike looks sharp. I like yeah, it. You look pretty good here, Shooter. You look very good. Uh, yeah, you, the pecs a little bit. Brush me off. Can you tell I hit the gym? I know you, even boys express me. We, I hit the gym a little bit. <laughs> That's ticker status for you right there. So what, what are your plans right now? Are you going to make your way up to the stands now and interact with some fans? There's a lot. There's a big freshman class here that's coming out to this game. We just chatted with the Student Booster Club president a few moments ago. They all want to meet you. So you can't keep the fans waiting. All right, Shooter Fox, the Marist College mascot. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you around this year, I'm sure. At www.maristfootballnetwork.com. You can follow us Twitter, Facebook, Flickr, YouTube. Again, I'm Matt Suter. He's Phil Torino, and we're joined by our three other members of Matt and Matt Roberti, Mike Quinn, and Rachel Blair. And so, Phil, about 25 minutes away from kickoff, let's get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts about today's game. This Marist defense has been spectacular over the first three games. Oh, there's no question about that. I think the, a, big, a big key for this team has to be starting earlier. Marist has yet to score a touchdown in the first quarter through three contests this season. I think a, a getting a points on the board earlier would be crucial for the squad moving against the Patriot League opponent. And one big thing about Marist today will have to be their red zone defense. Georgetown does not have a very good kicking game. They're just two of five on the season. So the better, the more that Marist can keep them out of the end zone, obviously that's a good thing. But to keep those momentum, you know, a guy lines up for a 35-yarder and hooks, hooks it white, right. That's just great. That gets the offense back on the field. The defense knows that they did their job. And again, this defense allowing under 20 points a game for those first th three weeks. So it's been a very, very strong start for this squad. And when we had offensive tackle Fed Selston in studio with us on Wednesday to work in our pregame show, um, he stressed to us how, how crucial it will be for this team to work on running the ball. I agree with him from the simple fact that that allows the Red Foxes to possess the ball more. As we speak, they've controlled the ball for about 26 minutes through each of the first three contests. Expanding on that, keeping the ball will be, do wonders for them. Absolutely. And then looking ahead to next week, again, a big matchup against Jacksonville. How important is a win today on this alumni weekend? We've seen a whole bunch of fans going by. There's still fans coming in with 20 minutes before a kickoff. This is... Would, this would be a big win for momentum's sake, looking ahead to that big matchup with the Dolphins next week. No, there's no question about that. And granted, it is not a conference matchup. It's not a Pioneer Football League game. But that being said, seeing how the Red Foxes opened up this season, they travel on the road, they capture a 20-7 to win at Sacred Heart. A great way to start. And two tough road decisions that they dropped at Bucknell and last week, 24-10 to against uh, Dayton. So coming home here against a non-league opponent, this is on my weekend, though. It is Alumni Weekend, and it is a team that has history. The two teams have really been very even over the past seven contests. The home team has won all seven. And for those of you just coming in a little bit about ourselves, we are the Marist Football Network. You can follow us online at www.maristfootballnetwork.com. I'm Matt Suter. He's Phil Brunio. We're joined by our three other crew members, Rachel Blair, Amanda Mastroberti, and Mike Quinn. So you can follow us online. And really, looking at this team, this is a team that certainly doesn't need a win, but they're very capable of taking on this Georgetown team that doesn't really run an intricate offense or defense. No, we, we've seen Maris match up against Patriot League teams in the years past, and something we touched on earlier, but, but still equally fascinating. Six of the last seven matchups between these two squads, the Red Foxes and the Hoyas, have been decided by seven points or less. Two of them have gone into overtime. We've seen last year was a 14-7 to decision, just like that over the past few years. Decisions in the same, the same ballpark of numbers. So looking ahead, again, Maris has Georgetown just in about 21 minutes. The opening kickoff uh, at home for the 2011 season, the first time the Red Foxes take the field at Tenney Stadium on Alumni Weekend. We really have a gorgeous day for it. Didn't look like it yesterday. We were a little worried we wouldn't be able to be here, but the sun came out, and honestly, they couldn't ask for a better setting for their home opener this season. And we're just getting set to wrap up here, which has been an excellent first pregame show. So just to give the fans an idea of what's going on with the Maris schedule moving forward. So far, we have seen the Red Foxes take on Sacred Heart, Bucknell, and Dayton. Today, of course, against Georgetown. Next weekend, October 1st, against Jacksonville, they'll be home. They go to Dayton then. Then they'll host Campbell, the Campbell Camels, on the 15th of October. They'll be at Butler, then against uh, Drake and Valparaiso here at Tenney Stadium. Finally wrapping up on November 12th at San Diego. So that about does it for our the Marist Football Network very first pregame show as we give way to the PA announcer.
The Hoyas are playing Marist today. So Marist takes on the Georgetown Hoyas in the 2011 home opener here on Alumni Weekend at Marist Stadium. Anyone that stopped by, thank you for joining us. For Phil Torino, Rachel Blair, Amanda Mastroverdi, and Mike Quinn, I am Matt Suter. Follow us online at www.maristfootballnetwork.com. We are the Marist Football Network. Enjoy the game. Marist is one and two.